The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 713, lucky 13, for Wednesday, June 13th, 2018. Folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, the show where we take your questions, your cool stuff found, your tips, our cool stuff found, our answers to your questions, your answers to our questions, and we mix it all together to present to you a lovely bouquet of information in a pleasant and entertaining way. With the goal being that each and every one of us learns five new things every time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include Crossover, where at uh, codeweavers.com slash MGG, you can save 35% with coupon code MGG. BB Edit from Bare Bones Software at barebones.com. And we heard some App Store news from them last week. And Setapp. Uh, where you can get over 100, actually over 119 apps for just 10 bucks a month, like Netflix for apps. We'll talk more about all of those in a few moments. But for now, here back in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. Hey, uh, happy anniversary, Mr. John F. Braun. Today is the oh. uh, 13th anniversary of our very first episode release. So, uh, so it's very interesting. It's seven thirteen. We're recording the episode on six thirteen, and it's our thirteenth anniversary. So there you go. I, I, I didn't get you anything. Sorry. <laughs> I, I got you another podcast to do. We'll just keep doing this. How's that sound? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very, very cool. Very cool. Uh, it doesn't. It's really. You know, I was uh, thinking about this. Um, my daughter graduated from high school on. Um, on Friday night. And when we did the first episode of this, she hadn't even started uh, kindergarten here in New Hampshire yet. Uh, in fact, we hadn't even moved here to New Hampshire yet. So, uh, so it's really interesting kind of all the, uh, all the life events that, that we've all been through in, uh, in the last 13 years. And, and of course, Matt Geek Cab has, has evolved and, and also kind of stayed true to our mission at the same time, which is helping people, helping you. And that's what we do. Yeah. And and we well, all help each other um, really is what it is. So, But our mission changed too, because when we started this, we didn't know what we were doing. It's true, right? The first we thought, yeah, you ahead. wanted to hear what we thought about stuff. Yeah. Like every and, other podcast. Yeah. yeah. Not that there's and anything then, wrong with that. I mean, it's, it's actually great, but yes. No, but then we kind of created our niche and then people started. Asking questions, but this is broken. Can you help me? Yeah. It's like, uh, so I, I don't know. I know I've told this story in person to many people, including many Mac Geekab listeners, but I don't know that we've ever told it here on the show. So you're right. Right. Jo what John just said is totally correct. That the first uh, I think it was the first two episodes may have been the first three, but I'm pretty sure it was the first two were us just talking about like the happenings of of the week. I mean, there was always a technical bent. I think. I think one of our first two episodes or first few episodes was about whatever version of Mac OS 10 had just, you know, come out at that point in time. And so we were talking about our thoughts about it. I want to say tiger, but I, I may be wrong on, on the, the years there, but you know, so it was, it was always like, but it was just self-generated, right? Whatever we thought we were going to talk about, we were going to talk about. And we got to, like I said, either the third or fourth episode and I was at a loss for inspiration and so I did what what any um, any any hungry podcaster would do, and I made up questions from the audience, and we answered those questions in the show. Right? I mean, it wasn't fake information. It was just some of the questions were fake. Some of them actually were sent in. I, I used to do a column at Mac Observer called Ask Dave, and I had stopped doing that years before we started doing uh, MGG, but. Uh, that email address, which was askdave at macobserver.com, still came to me. And so I kind of mined through some of those things. It was like, oh, yeah, we could answer this question or that question. So we made up a bunch of questions or pulled from that and kind of a combination of both. And we did our first, you know, mailbag show. And 
And since then, we've been doing mailbag shows for, you know, 13 years <laughs> because that opened, like John said, we, we kind of, you know, created and found our niche and something that worked for you and something you did, weren't getting elsewhere and, and, and something, frankly, we love to do. So it's, uh, so it's, it's very cool how this has all worked out. It's good. Yeah. So you're right. We've stayed true to our mission that we stumbled upon after we started the show, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, uh, you know, I think the uh, the space of people saying what they or basically Mac News. It's uh, there's a lot of options out there. There are there weren't back then. To be fair, right? I mean, we were not entering a crowded market 13 years ago. I mean, Adam was Adam at uh, Adam Christensen at MacCast was pretty well established. In fact, I I still consider us you know newer podcasters because. You know, when we started, there were all those guys like Adam Christensen, Dave Slusher and Brian Ibbett, Adam Curry doing, uh, you know, that have been doing Ken. podcasts. Ken was Ken before us. That's possible. Allison Sheridan was before us, although I didn't find for whatever reason, I didn't find out about her show until um, shortly after we had started Matt Geekab, But but she's been doing no silicast longer than us. Um but I don't, I, I didn't, I don't know. Was Ken, Ken was on Inside Mac Radio before he started Mac OS Ken, right? Mm-hmm. With Scott Shepard. Now we're, now we're walking down memory lane. It was bound to happen, right? Here we are in the 13th episode. So, so yeah, yeah, it's uh, very interesting. Interesting stuff. Of course, Sean King uh, at Your Mac Life has been doing something that we now would call podcasting for much longer than any of the rest of us have uh, including those people that started podcasting. He wasn't distributing the way that we do now and the way he does now. He was distributing through Audible and just online and, and all of that. And then, you know, Dave Slusher and Dave Weiner and Adam Curry kind of all, well, it was Slusher and uh, Curry and Weiner that sort of figured out the the whole or applied the whole RSS logic to it. And then Slusher, I think, built one of the first podcatchers and all that good stuff. So anyway, that's... Uh, but here we are. So, I, you know, I, those of you in the live stream at MacGeekUp.com slash stream. Hello. Thank you for joining us on uh, this special episode. But uh, th- those of you in the live stream know we made an agenda change at the very last minute. We were going to start with a bunch of cool stuff found, and uh, which is normally how we'll kind of front load things that way. But I figured, you know, we, we answer questions. So let's just do that. Let's answer some questions and start that way. Shall we, John? Surely. Surely. All right. So listener John writes in, he says, I have a Mac Pro 2012 that I have on all the time. He says, yes, I reboot it weekly and I keep it up to date with the latest software patches. He says, I had an eight bay Drobo connected to it for my iTunes library. I wanted to save some energy. And so I purchased an eight terabyte single Seagate external drive. I connected it and transferred the library. I also have a four bay raid that has my time machine and my movies on it. And I have an external drive to clone my boot drive. So now I figured I would be set. When I woke up the next morning, though, I found the following. All the drives were ejected and repeatedly asked with Notification Center. uh, You know, it told me disk not ejected properly. uh, Eject it before disconnecting or turning it off. Is there a way that I can have the drives properly ejected and or mounted before or after the pro goes to sleep? Um. So, yes. And of course, the answer is, in theory, Mac OS should take care of this for you. But sometimes some external drives do not play nice with the way Mac OS wants to do this. And they don't quite get the message, for lack of a better term, that the system really hasn't gone away, that it's just asleep and that things should stay mounted and all of that. So I have two options to try. One is built into Mac OS. And that is go to system preferences, energy saver, and uncheck the box that says put hard disks to sleep when possible. I've seen that have uh, issues with external, with some, you know, third party external drives. And we just had another listener that we were having an email trail with uh, report some success after disabling that with a similar issue. However, I'm not entirely convinced that's going to solve it. So option number two St. Clair Software, the people that make the great default folder and app tamer, also make an app called Jettison. Uh, Jettison is built for those of us on laptops 
that want to that have external drives, say at our our desks at the office or whatever. But you want to you don't want to have to think about oh, let me eject my external drive first, then put my MacBook to sleep. Then I can remove I can detach the drive and and move and walk away. That's I mean that's what we should do, but that's sort of a convoluted process and often. Uh, you know, you forget and then you're like, oh, do I just disconnect it and deal with the warning message or do I wake it back up, eject the drive, wait for it to eject all that stuff? What Jettison does is it essentially inserts itself into the process where the drive is about to go to sleep or the Mac is about to go to sleep. So you would close the lid. Jettison would notice that this machine was about to go to sleep and it would go and eject all of your drives properly. Then let your Mac go to sleep. Of course, if the drives are still plugged in when your Mac wakes up, your Mac will naturally just mount them because they are seen as quote unquote new again and everything should be fine. So I think Jettison might be your answer here. And I, I got to look at the, the pricing on it, but I think it's like, uh, I don't know, 15 bucks or something like that. So it's, it's not overly expensive. It's certainly not any more than it's not 50. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up. Thoughts on this, John? John. I'm going to take oh, the it's five hardware dollars. angle. There you go. This. It's five. So there you go. Okay. I'm going to take the hardware angle and that I have. So you, you'll get this message if you decide to just yank a drive. Right. But that may be happening on the hardware side is that it could be a flaky USB port. Okay. Has. I think it's USB, right? Yeah, 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 it would be. Yep. Or a cable. I've I've had issues where I've gotten this message and it was due to a flaky cable. So maybe try another USB port. That or certainly. Yeah. Swap out the cable it, because yeah, it could be you have an intermittent uh connection and that's when you get this message when it's like, "Hey, you went away. Why'd you go away?" Yep. And I would look at what you have connected to that new, I think you said it was a Seagate drive, uh John, <laughs> listener John. Uh, because that's the new thing you added and, and now these issues started to appear. So, you know, what, how did you connect that? Did you have to add a new switch? Is there a cable, uh, not switch, uh, USB hub, man, I got too many things on my brain. Uh, you know, is there a cable between your iMac and the, or your Mac pro and the hub like that, all of that stuff. So, yeah, cool. Any more on this one, John, or is it time to move on? Moving on. Moving on. All right. Well, we will go to listener Jed and Jed, we will let you ask your own question. Hey guys, this is Jed. I was just listening to your WDC wrap up uh, episode kind of thing. And I had a question because you said something that surprised me. You were saying that the desktop is just like the documents folder. Is it just that I have institutional memory and that, because I remember that putting stuff on the desktop, sooner or later would actually cause some slowdown on your Mac. So I clean up my desktop, A, just to be organized, uh, like John. But also, because I always assumed if you had a lot of stuff on your desktop, it would end up slowing your computer down like it used to. Is this gone? Is that not happening anymore? Anyways, just curious. Let me know. Thanks. Thanks for the note, Jed. Um, y- you know, I, I, I do remember a time when this was the case, John, but... I don't think that's the case anymore. Uh, you know, I, I, and I think it was in the early days of the Finder, the act of displaying all those icons on the desktop was uh, not as optimized, perhaps, as it is now. And and so because the desktop is a folder that also has its contents appear graphically at all times behind every window, like I, I think there was something about that, but I don't. I don't think that's the case now. What do you think, John? No, no, no. It's just part of your, um, I mean, it's just, it's just part of your folder. home folder. Yeah. Or right, part right. of your iCloud drive. Cause I just looked at my system and I'm like, where's desktop? If right. If you choose to, uh, enable a certain feature of iCloud, then your desktop is actually, uh, well, it's still on your desktop, of course, but it's also replicated in, uh, in the iCloud drive. It always takes me by surprise sometimes because I'll, I'll, if I delete something from my desktop, it's like, uh, you're removing something from iCloud. Uh, just thought you'd like to know about that. I'm like, yeah, oh, right. Okay, thanks. Right. 
That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I have not yet made that plunge, John, the, the iCloud drive holding my documents and desktop folder. I mean, I, I sync my documents. I use Synology's drive, which used to be called cloud station drive uh, to, you know, sync my not my documents folder, but a documents folder amongst all of my Macs. So I have that data everywhere. But I I had started doing that before I wound up getting a lot more iCloud storage. Um, and I like the private cloud idea and, and all that stuff. So it, it I, I never really rethought that. But how well does that work for you? Is it is it a pretty smooth process, the the iCloud drive syncing it's, your desktop and documents? I mean it's pretty transparent. It's awesome. I mean the only thing I had to do, so the only surprise is that if you enable this feature is um well, I actually have a, uh, so what happens, it'll create a folder specific to that, that machine. So like I have one, you know, I see right now it's called documents dash JB Mac mini. Sure. And I actually have a shortcut to that in my sidebar. So when I do want to, you know, put things in my documents folder, um, it makes it a little easier. <clears throat> huh? Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. All right. All right. Yeah. That's the only thing that, that threw me is when you enable this feature, the the hierarchy or your, uh, you know, the where you put things is a little, it may not be where you expect you should put them. So. Oh, it, 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 when you're fine. when you're navigating to it, if you don't have the shortcut in your sidebar, you mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. That, yeah, 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 I can see that totally. Huh. No, but again, it's seamless and, you know, it's just nice to know that my documents are uh, in multiple places or being synced to the cloud without my having to do anything. Without you having to mess with it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Huh. All right. Well, that's cool. Maybe I, I you know, I, I keep thinking I should just do that uh, specifically for the desktop folder. I feel like, you know, moving between different Macs, it would be handy to not. To, to just not have to think about that. So I don't know, you know, then, I, then, then I feel like I'm, I'm kind of breaking my whole thought process of, of the, uh, the, you know, private cloud and all that stuff. So I don't know. I gotta, yeah. 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 And yeah. for people that want to check this out, where you would go is you would go to system preferences, iCloud, and there's an iCloud drive entry and then an options dot, dot, dot button and one of the choices is desktop and documents folders all right so if you haven't enabled it i think when when they started offering that feature i think there was an upgrade where it's like oh hey by the way you know we got this cool new feature you want to do this and i'm like eh, why not yeah so yeah and, right uh, no i remember being offered it but at the time i didn't have a lot of icloud storage so it was like no no no, no don't do that but um but yeah, yeah, it seems like everybody, like listeners and, you know, all you folks and obviously you, John, and basically anybody I talk to says, oh, yeah, it's, it's like, it's not a, it's not a thing. We, we never get questions about it not working, like, which is a really good litmus test <laughs> for us here. So, yeah. All right. Cool, man. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Ryan. Ryan asks, uh, he said, I feel as if I've heard you address this in a previous episode. He says, but I can't find it. He says, I use Daisy Disk to keep an eye on my storage usage on my 2015 Retina MacBook Pro. I used it today when my MacBook Pro told me I didn't have enough disk space for my iPhone backup. Uh, he says, I could use the cloud, but I'm anal and I like multiple backups. I don't blame you, Ryan. That's smart. He says, I scanned as an admin using Daisy Disk. And about half of my 500 gig hard drive is filled with quote unquote hidden files that Daisy Disk says it cannot locate. I use shift command period uh, shortcut that we talked about here on Mac Geekab to reveal hidden files in Macintosh hard drive. But I don't see anything adding up to the hidden files amount that Daisy Disk says. He says I've ran disk utility and first aid and all that stuff. What are these hidden files? So Daisy Disk is one of 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 a few pieces of software that will scour your drive and tell you what is taking up all your space. And I've tried Daisy disc before and it's got a beautiful user interface. It's one of the nicest interfaces that I've seen on these types of, of packages, but I've always felt like it's hiding something from me or not showing me everything. 
And it's for that reason that I always wind up reverting back to Omni Disk Sweeper, which now is available for free from Omni from the Omni Group, and it it just works. You, you, you Ryan sort of casually mentioned it in his question, but it's it's important to note. If you just run any of these apps normally by going to the applications folder and double clicking them, you risk not seeing everything because the app can't see everything if it's not running as an admin. So I run this from the terminal. It's a simple terminal command that you can paste in. We've got an article that shows you exactly what to do. And when you paste this terminal command in, it runs it with a, as a fully privileged user and that way you can see everything that's there. And we'll put a link in the show notes to just how to do this uh, with Omni Disk Sweeper. But, um, but Omni Disk Sweeper will show you, and I have not had it misguide me or, or lead me astray. So I, I, I think that's the magic answer. Ryan said he went to try it again, and those files were gone. So maybe they were temp files. Maybe I don't know what they were. So what do you think, John? I think I remember wrestling with this. and. When I last ran Daisy Disk, uh, yeah, I saw the same thing. It was a real head scratcher for us because, yeah, it was like, uh, I don't know if you're exactly showing me what I want to see. Right, right. <laughs> and yeah. then I couldn't figure out what the hidden stuff was either. And it's yeah. like, you know, that was it? I mean, it could have been stale data in a cache uh, or something like that. But it, it was just like, I, I don't think you're, I don't think you're telling me. Yeah, you're not giving me what I want to, what I want to know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I've never, I'd never had that issue with, uh, you know, like you, with um, Omni Disk Sweeper. So yeah, it just works. It it it's it's not, it's not the prettiest interface, but but it is the most functional because what it does is it gives you kind of it it it's very similar to that. It adopts, in fact, that that multi column Finder view, but it sorts everything by space used. So, you know, you start with just one column of stuff in the upper left, which is, you know, the root level of your hard drive or whatever you told it to scan. And it's sorted by space used. So, you know, it's just continually surfacing to the top the things that are using the most space. And you can just drill down. It's very, very efficient to do this. And you can go to the folder where, you know, you can open the enclosing folder if you want to see. And it, it's really, really handy. And I it, this reminds me, I need to run it on this machine. I've only got a 250 gig SSD inside it. And uh, and I'm down to seven gigs of available space, which is dangerous. So I need to run it on here at some point. I thought I had solved this problem on this machine, but evidently, no. So check it out on my disk sweeper. Hopefully that'll solve it for you, Ryan. And hopefully everybody else too. Listener John asks, uh, he says, I've been using Plex Cloud to stream music. Sorry, to string, stream, easy for me to say, movies from Dropbox and OneDrive to my TV via the Plex app on my Roku. Uh, you could do the same on your Apple TV. Uh, except, he says, I noticed that back in February, Plex announced that it was no longer accepting new Plex cloud customers and was reevaluating the service. They've been getting a lot of flack from the uh, cloud service providers who don't want to host potentially pirated movies. So that I think I think that's why. Uh, I don't know for certain, but it certainly stands to reason. Uh, he says this has me because you you put the, the idea behind the Plex cloud services. You put your own stuff on Dropbox and then Plex will read from Dropbox and stream it. Well, you know, is Dropbox complicit in some piracy in that scenario because they're hosting the file? Could be argued. Yes, maybe not. Who knows? Right. So uh, I think that's why Plex is getting out of this. He says, this has me concerned, though, and I'm looking for an alternative to stream from Dropbox and OneDrive. I know I can use apps like VLC Media Player on my iPhone and iPad, but there's nothing I've found that actually works on the Roku besides Plex. Any suggestions? He says, I don't want to set up a NAS with my own library uh, or an alternate server. He says, it doesn't really work for me and isn't warranted for the volume of movies and TV shows that I have. So it's a good question. I'm I'm not really a... a I've used Roku at Roku, Roku at times, mostly in Airbnbs. Um, and I have logged into my Plex server from there. And then, of course, you know, make myself a big note to log out before I leave and check out of the Airbnb. But um, but I've never you know, I, I don't have one, so I'm not fully versed in this stuff. I did some digging, though. Uh, 
you know, on the Apple TV, anybody that wants to do this kind of thing, there are apps like VLC that he said it runs on iPhone and iPad and it does also runs on your Mac, but it also runs on Apple TV. Uh, Infuse from Firecore also runs on Apple TV and really it's gorgeous and it works really well. So uh, so that's another uh, that's another one to uh, to check out. Um on the Roku, though, it looks like they used to have a Dropbox app slash channel that you could add, uh, but it seems like that has gone away. But there is one called Roxbox or Roxbox for Dropbox, R-O-K-S-B-O-X. And uh, and it looks like that might do exactly what you want. So hopefully that helps for you and any of the Roku users. I know we probably I'd actually be curious. uh let us know. Uh, you can let us know on Twitter at Mac Geek Gab or um, actually, you know what? I'll post a link in our brand new Mac Geek Gab Q&A forums uh, asking what uh, what box you use on your what streaming box you use on your TV. And I would love to get some answers there. So uh, we did just yesterday launched our uh, long-awaited Mac Geek Gab Q&A forums. You can find them at macgeekgab.com slash forums. They are not linked publicly from Mac Observer yet. We're kind of soft launching it and letting everybody know. But uh, it, it, we eventually will, obviously. But, uh, but you know, we want a soft launch with a uh, with friendly audience here, of course. So macgeekgab.com slash forums will bring you there. And I'll put a I'll put a link after the show's up unless one of you beats me to it, which is totally fine, especially one of you in the uh, chat room. If you want to go and add a post there in the Q&A form asking what folks use, then I'll take the link to that and put it in. So one of us will do this, but I'd be very curious to, to hear what everybody uses, because my guess is I know Roku is in, generally speaking way more popular than Apple TV or any of the others. So I'm, I'm just curious to, to know what everybody uses it would actually be good. In terms of our coverage and, you know, knowing what to do. You use, uh, you use Apple TV, right, John? Yeah, I still have the, uh, I think it's the third gen. But, um, right, that's right. Yep. My cool. streaming, for the most part, is, uh, it's all in my Synology video station. And so you, can, you don't have the app on your you don't have a video station app on or a plex app on your apple tv right you you do it from your phone correct and then airplay from the disc station directly to the apple tv right yeah they whatever trick they use the to, tricks uh, yes exactly stuff to uh yeah that works really play. well yeah or i guess they're basically establishing an airplay uh conversation that's correct. Yeah, the Apple TV just sees it as an AirPlay conversation, which is great because then you can use the Apple TV remote to pause and play and all that good stuff. Yeah, and uh, uh, I guess the other streaming is, uh, you know, I got Netflix a while ago, and that's, sure. uh, that's always fun. Netflix is great, yeah. It's, it's, they, they certainly know how to, uh, how to keep us uh, entertained and engaged. So, yeah. You know. All right. One last question before we, we might come back to questions, but uh, one last in this block from listener, Peter, who actually I got a, what, the pleasure of seeing last night at our Seacoast Mac users group. Peter writes, he says, when I'm using public Wi-Fi, uh, like right now at a Wendy's, I can usually always get a signal and use the internet. But at the same time, I often cannot send or sometimes even receive email. Uh, any thoughts on the cause or the cure? So um, th this is, I've seen this happen on some public Wi-Fi networks, not all of them, but some where the, uh, the network doesn't let you send email or I've seen it at, at like my kid's high school, their guest network doesn't let you connect to Gmail. And, uh, and, and so, you know, nothing of the sort would work there if, if you use Gmail as your email provider unless you use a VPN. So that's one of the reasons I use a VPN, but, but with, if it's sending email in particular, sometimes those public Wi-Fi uh, things will block the unsecured ports for email, specifically port 25 so that people mm -hmm. aren't using it to blast out 
uh, you know, email and potentially be a spammer right. and all that stuff. I mean, there's there's not a lot of opportunity for that anymore, to be perfectly honest, because even port 25 unsecured, most email servers won't let you send without authenticating. And so someone knows who you are at some level. But um, but yeah, trying to use going into on your Mac, go to you know mail preferences, accounts, choose your mail account, go to server settings and choose edit SMTP server list under the outgoing mail account and then choose the outgoing mail server that you use and look at the port that is set. If automatically managed connection settings is enabled, temporarily disable it and look at what port is chosen and whether or not use TLS SSL is checked. If the port's 25, then it's, that's could be it. Try using either 587 or 465 and see if you can send mail through that. That would be that would be my my guess. Or get a VPN, which honestly, you probably want to consider anyway if you're doing a lot of stuff from public Wi-Fi networks on a regular basis just to cover your bases. So what do you think, Mr. Braun? Yeah, I think that's why they're doing it. The other thing is um, a lot of ISPs will not let you set up a server on port 25 for the exact same reason, because That's they right. don't want you hosting a source of, uh, a source of spam. Right. Right. Yeah. They don't want you to be the, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They don't want it to echo through you either. That's right. And I think you can even see this if you run, um, I haven't run this for a while here, but, um, I don't know if you've run this, but, um, uh, Gibson Research, which I think is also a security now, they have a little tool called uh, Shields Up that'll actually probe your system and say, oh yeah, by the way, these ports are, uh, they're probably not going to work. Because uh, your ISP doesn't want you doing any funny business. Oh, nice. I will, uh, I will put a link to Shields Up from GRC. Yeah, Steve Gibson's a, uh, he's a smart guy and he's a crazy guy and he's kind of a really entertaining guy. His, like you said, his Security Now podcast is um very informative he's he's uh he's great he's great cool all right uh how about we talk about our uh our sponsors for this episode john that worked for you fantastic sweet uh our first sponsor for this episode is crossover from code weavers this is uh this allow crossover allows you to run Windows apps on your Mac without having to run Windows. And if you haven't set this up and played with it recently, I highly encourage you to do so. Go to codeweavers.com slash MGG. You get a 14 day free trial there. You don't need to enter a credit card or anything. And then you install the app, you, you know, you run crossover and then you just install Windows apps into it. So if you need to, like if you're a Quicken user, and you want to use the real version of Quicken uh, from, you know, from uh, into it. Well, it's not into it anymore, but it's the real version of Quicken. Do it. It, it. The Windows version is way more full featured than the Mac version. So just do it inside crossover. But it just runs. You don't it doesn't run Windows. It's kind of magic how it all just pulls it together. And they've really done a good job at sort of unifying this experience and making it totally seamless. So and of course, you can run Microsoft Office. And all kinds of things. So it's really worth checking out. Go to codeweavers.com slash MGG. Download your, your free trial. It's 14 days. Make sure it works with the apps you want. Like, good to go. And then when you go back to buy, make sure you remember MGG because coupon code MGG saves you 35% on your purchase. So go and check that out. Our thanks to Code Weavers and Crossover for sponsoring this episode. Our second sponsor is BB Edit. You all know how much we love BB Edit here. It's one of our favorite pieces of software. I have it open on my Mac right now. It's what we use to kind of manage all of the show notes and, uh, and the uh, timestamps and all of that because it's just text. It doesn't add any crazy formatting. And if somebody has added crazy formatting like me or one of you in the chat room, it doesn't matter. BB Edit just turns it all into raw text that we can go and put inside the episode file so that you get your beautiful chapters and all of that stuff. But that's not the only reason to use BB edit. You can use it to manage, uh, you can count words with it. You can count, uh, 
uh, characters and lines. And if you're doing any coding, well, that's where BB Edit really springs to life because it detects what language you're using. It could be, you know, C++, it could be HTML, it could be JavaScript, doesn't matter. It's all known and right there. So you got to check it out. Go to barebones.com because it's not in the app store quite yet, but it sounds like from the keynote last week, it's coming. Go to barebones.com and uh, and download your your trial copy, but it's really not a trial copy. You get the full featured trial for 30 days. And then after that, you get a limited feature set for free forever. And for many of us, that limited feature set might actually be all you need. So go check it out, barebones.com. And our thanks to Barebones for sponsoring this episode. Our third sponsor is a new sponsor, but it's not something that's new to us. That is SetApp at setapp.com. SetApp is like Netflix for apps. You pay 10 bucks a month and you get this folder of apps on your Mac that you can just use. It's always the latest version. Uh, you don't have to pay extra. You don't have to go and get a license code for the apps. You just launch the app. You pay your 10 bucks a month. They've got over 119 apps with names like Ulysses, Bartender. We've talked about that a lot. Amazing. We talk about that a lot. And they're growing the app collection every month. Of course, SetApp is from MacPaw, which is the company that creates and makes Clean My Mac. That's also included in SetApp. They curate this list. So it's, you know, it's over, like I said, well over 100 apps from reputable vendors. You don't have to waste time sifting through all the stuff on the app store. It's just installed right there. Makes it really easy. No paid upgrades, no in-app purchases or other hidden costs. Every app is fully functional and set app is free to try and you can earn up to six months for free by referring your friends. So go ahead, visit setapp.com and check it out. And our thanks to setapp and MacPaw for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, I got to experience a lot of interesting things last week, both uh, in terms of traveling and, and all that stuff. And one of them was the new Sonos Beam which is their most recent smart speaker. Uh, and it's interesting. I've always called Sonos speakers smart speakers, but now that they've started adding voice uh, controls to them, it's like they're smart, smart speakers. But they, uh, it, this new Sonos Beam has uh, microphones in it, comes with Amazon A-Lady support out of the box, and Google Assistant support will be coming to Sonos too. So you can actually pick which voice assistant you want inside your speaker. And that's true. The Sonos one too, but it's a, it's a, it's a sound bar for your living room and it can either just sit on the table in front of your TV or it can mount on the wall. Uh, it's got four drivers in it and then a couple passive radiators too, but the drivers are spread around. So you get this huge wide stereo field and I haven't tested it in my own house yet. Uh, but Testing it in their listening rooms in San Francisco last week, it was obvious that it sounds good. I, I don't, you know, want to make any comparisons or anything yet uh, because I haven't been able to do it here at home. But it certainly sounds good, and the stereo field on this thing is super wide. I mean, it's crazy wide. So great for you know targeted at, at watching TV, but also built because as Sonos always has been to play music out loud in your home, and with support from. Uh, you know, the A-Lady, you can use your voice. Uh, AirPlay 2 is coming to uh, most, uh, any new Sono speakers uh, in uh, in July, so next month. And this speaker, the, the Sonos Beam will be supported. And it's $399, which makes it a really interesting thing when you're considering a HomePod. So, um, so I'm curious to review this, especially with that in mind. Because the HomePod really isn't, engineered to play sound from your TV. You can do it, but you can only do, you know, that which can be airplayed to it. The Sonos Beam's got an HDMI port in it. So, it, and it can take the ARC, the audio return channel from your TV. So anything that can play on your TV generally can play uh, into Sonos Beam. And if all you've got out of your TV is an optical cable, they've built this little adapter that goes optical to HDMI. So you can use that too. So I'm curious to check it out. Um, and learn more, but it's pretty cool. And, and at that price, that's, 
that's a pretty aggressive price for Sonos. Everything else that they've offered for the living room has been, you know, in the $700 range. And so this really changes that quite a bit. So any, any thoughts or questions on that, John, before we move on to all these other crazy things that I've checked out? No, I've, I've seen sound bars before, but, right. you know, if it's from them. Um, yeah. I don't know if, if, I don't know if my environment would really benefit from one. I think huh? it, I think your environment is the exact environment that they really? have built this for. Yeah. It's, it's for, you know, kind of the, 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 the smaller living room or apartment kind of, kind of thing. Right. Um, I mean, they're still selling their play bar, which, you know, we use in our living room, but, you know, I'm 15 feet away from my TV um, and your living room, you're, you, you know, it's just a smaller room. So you're closer. I think the, the, um, the beam is, is perfectly, is, is built exactly for you where you're using either your TV sound or maybe your TV sound plus some, some other speakers that aren't, you know, really built to do that. This is, this is built to be the answer to be simple and you're good to go. I think, but we got to check it out. We'll, we'll, we will check it out and we will report back once we, uh, once we have the opportunity to do that. So, and y you know, it was interesting, John, last week, obviously I was in San Jose for the first couple of days amongst all of the folks that are, you know, there for WWDC and Apple followers and, and some of whom would even be the Apple faithful. Right. And the general consensus kind of like we talked about on the show last week was that I, we were all really happy with Apple's decision to focus, especially with iOS, more on stability and performance than on, you know, new whiz bang features and all of that stuff. Right. And then I took the train from San Jose to San Francisco, which is, you know, about an hour long train ride. It's not that far away. And uh, I did that on Tuesday because Sonos had their announcement on Wednesday. So I needed to be there in time for that. And, uh, so Tuesday night, starting Tuesday night, I was sort of immersed with the general tech press and general, uh, you know, home theater folks, people that are very interested in technology, certainly like we are here, but not necessarily Apple watchers, right? Apple, Apple faithful, you know, they, they just watch Apple kind of on the periphery. And of course, the folks at Sonos were watching to see, was Apple going to do anything that can, that changed the, you know, what the HomePod does? Cause, cause you know, that's where some stuff is. And as soon as we, I got there and people were talking about the Apple keynote, it was, that was the worst keynote I've ever seen. Boring. They didn't add any new features. There was no new hardware. It's like, oh, this is interesting. Cause this is how some of the rest of the world sees this. It was just very enlightening. It's like, oh, right, right. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not everybody is as deep into this Apple thing as we are. And it didn't change my opinion. Like, I still really feel like, you know, iOS 12, aka iOS 11.5 was totally the right move for Apple to, to do. But it was just interesting. So I figured I'd share that. Any uh, any thoughts on that, John, before we, before we move on? I liked it. Same. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's good. Uh, have you run iOS 12 on anything yet, John? No. Okay. I put it on not my production iPhone, but one of the production iPhones that we have here at the house. I put it on my son's per, per his request. And, uh, and it's really been super stable, way more stable than any other, you know, first developer beta and it doesn't like there's not anything remarkably different about it. Yes, there's the screen time features and that sort of thing. And I actually put it on my iPad, too, but uh, which is my main iPad, like the one that I, I use almost every day. And you, you almost don't notice that you're running a different operating system because basically you aren't right. It, it really is. It feels like iOS 11.5. So that whole stability and performance thing is really uh, is really true about this. I'm not necessarily advocating for everybody to go out and get the betas, but if you are someone that generally does that, you can probably dip your toe in the beta waters earlier rather than later. And perhaps even for somebody who doesn't want to run betas, you know, this is perhaps one of the first times where I would say, uh, don't necessarily feel like you have to wait until 12.1 to make the switch. 12.0 might be, it's too early to say, but 12.0 might be, 
you know, very stable because that's what they're focusing on here. They're not, they're not making any, you know, serious fundamental changes that they then need to sort of road test. Uh, I haven't found m any apps really that don't work or anything like that. So I'm sure they're out there, but yeah, it's been pretty good. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have another, I have another cool thing. I can't wait to tell you about John. Can I tell you about it? Oh yeah. Quiet. Okay. So, uh, plume is the one mesh Wi-Fi company that I had not yet tested. And, uh, and, and they, their whole model is these little devices that plug into, uh, power outlets, right? They call them pods. And they plug into power outlets and they have Ethernet ports on them. Uh, at least the new ones do. Yes, there are new ones announced today. Um, and I think the old ones did too. Uh, and uh, they, you just put them, you know, you, the, the idea is you put a bunch of them in rooms around your house and it builds this mesh. They don't like to use the word mesh because they say traditional mesh uh, means that everything's using the same channel for communication amongst the mesh, but that's not actually how most of these quote unquote mesh systems work. And, and it's definitely not how plume works. They, you know, they, they look at all the, they look at the airwaves and spectrum and, and do uh, intelligent routing and, and choose intelligent channels, but they've got two things that are happening today. Number one is their new plume super pods are coming out and I'll talk about that, but they're also changing the way you pay for this. Uh, which gets very interesting. So the super pods are super cool. They are uh, the, the original ones had two radios in them, a 2.4 and a five, and they were both two by two radios. This new super pod has a, uh, has three radios. It adds to those original two. It adds another five gigahertz radio. That is a four by four radio, just like the Netgear Orbi and the plume is unlike the Orbi, the plume will use all three radios for anything. So uh, oftentimes it will use that four by four radio for backhaul between the plume units because it can be most efficient at doing that. But if you have like an iMac or a MacBook or something that is uh, connected to one of your plume pods, it might choose to use the five gigahertz four by four radio to talk to that because your MacBook or uh, MacBook Pro rather and iMac can run. Uh, they have three by three radios, whereas like your iPhone is only two by two. Uh, and I have to say it's real. I've set these up on Sundays, so I have to be very careful how much excitement I, I have to temper my excitement here because the setup process of this was amazing. I've never been more impressed with the initial setup of a mesh system as I was with these new plume super pods. I plug them in. I follow the instructions, right? I plugged them in. Now, you know, I test things all the time here, John. So I just plugged them in and was going to do, you know, essentially a double NAT scenario and create a separate plume network inside of my existing Wi-Fi because, you know, that's how I test initially. And then I'll promote it to kind of being, you know, the main Wi-Fi for the house. And I, I plugged it in. I, you, it uses uh, Bluetooth to know that you're near your phone and assign names. And that part was super easy. You just go and tap the pod with your phone. It's like, all right, great. What do you want to name it? So I did all that, but it, it figured out that I already had a router running and it was like, oh, we don't want to do double NAT mode. I'm just going to put myself in bridge mode. It's no problem. And it just happened automatically. Like I didn't even need to think about it and it just worked, but I didn't lose any functionality in terms of what I can see. In fact, this app is awesome um, in terms of how much visibility you get. I'll have to share some screenshots. I couldn't share them obviously until today, but uh, you get this like little map of the planets that shows all your plume pods and it has little moons orbiting the planets that show your actual devices connected to each pod and then there's lines between the planets showing how the pods are connected to each other and how your mesh is all laid out. And they're doing a lot of really uh, what I would call aggressive in a good way. Management of not only 
band steering. So saying, okay, well, you connected to the 2.4 gigahertz band, but you that particular client, we know that's an iPhone. It should be on the five gigahertz band. You're close enough. Like this is good. It it does all that steering and it will use, you know, all the technology like 802.11 KV and R, which are the things that sort of manage that steering. But some devices don't answer to that, but they're cloud based. So they know what device, what de device types will connect and uh, the right way and which device types will answer to these different um, uh, types of, of, of steering methodologies. And so they use all kinds of different ways to force devices onto the right pod and the right radio and all of that. And it, it happens really quickly. And the cool part is you can see it like with it, all the other ones, like, you know, and I mean, I really like Euro, but it's really hard to see in real time when a device has moved from one, you know, access point to the other, this just shows you and it, but it's not overly geeky, right? Like it's not, it's not a pain in the neck about it. It's just very visual, vis, vis, uh, very visual. Is that the right word? I think so. It's just really mm -hmm. well laid out. Um, and if you have one pod that's too far away, it'll say there's a poor connection to that. Want to troubleshoot it and it'll, it'll show you, but, but that's kind of the nice thing, right? Is with all these others, I have no easy way of seeing which pods are being used. Like right now I can see that there's one pod that I put in the kid's bathroom. So I named it kid's bathroom and it's got one device connected to it. And then everything else, you know, is on all these others. So it's like, well, maybe I should move that one out of the kid's bathroom and maybe put it between the other two where that this other one is having issues. And you can just see it very visual, very well laid out. I can, I can get information on all these devices and the speeds are good. You know, I, you guys know, I don't obsess about the speeds. I check them to make sure that they're not super slow, but, um, but the speeds are good. It's not quite as fast as the Linksys Velop, but I would say it, it falls kind of between the Velop and the Eero in my environment. And Eero is not slow by any stretch, right? I mean, we're talking, you know, like the Velop I could get to uh, in my network. And so your network's going to be different, but the Velop I could get to test out it you know, on my iPhone, uh, eh, somewhere in the 450 megabits per second range, which is pretty fast. The Eero sits at, you know, like mm, 250, 300, sometimes 350. And actually, that's about where the plume sits is right in that range. But I've only had it running for a couple of days and I need to give plume more time because, like I said, they're cloud managed. So they um, they keep optimizing your network over time. In fact, I've seen the lines change. Like, you know, I'll see, Oh, these two things are connected to each other this way. These two pods are connected to each other. And then I'll, you know, I'll check a couple hours later and it's like, ah, no, I've made a better decision here. It, the, the way your network, the way you use it, we should connect them this way. And then it does. So it's really cool. Um, now the pricing, John, they're selling packs with the new super pods alone or then you know one new super pod with some of the old original pods so a pack with one super pod and four of the original pods which would be good for i would say most homes is 99 bucks five pods one super pod four original pods 99 bucks but he, there there is a catch it's not a bad catch but there is a catch that gets you the hardware and and basic use of those pods. But if you want all of these sort of cloud-based smarts, you need a subscription to the Plume uh, service. And the subscription is 60 bucks a year or 200 bucks lifetime. So you can be out the door for, you know, 159 bucks and that gets you a full year of all the service. And then if you, if it expires, like you can still use all your pods, that's fine. You just don't necessarily get all the cloud smarts. They are confident enough that you will get enough value out of that, that, that you'll pay again, which I really, really like, which is really cool. And then there's prices kind of all over the map. You can get a, a pack with uh, three of the super pods is one ninety nine um, Cause the super pods are newer and, you know, more radios and all that stuff. So to be fair, I've been testing in my house with five super pods. They, they sent me a pack with four of them. And then, uh, 
And then one more for the office uh, because, you know, I've got this stretch here, but I'm getting a decent connection wirelessly. Uh, I disconnected it from the ethernet here in the office just to check. I, I'm getting what I would call a decent connection wirelessly across the driveway with these super pods, but I only changed to that this morning. So I'm, I'm kind of letting it uh, settle in and see how it does. So it's pretty cool, man. It's pretty cool. I'm like I said, I have to temper my excitement here because, you know, sometimes the new shiny gets the best of me. But uh, but I'm not feeling that here. I'm I'm feeling pretty confident. If if it's if it's any if it speaks to this, I've already moved. I, I set these up on Sunday and by Sunday night I was like, yeah, I trust this enough. I moved my house's main Wi-Fi to the plumes uh, temporarily, you know, for for. But it, I usually let it run several days before moving my main Wi-Fi to it. But I did this right away. Uh, you know, within an hour of setting it up, it's like, oh, okay, I can trust this. I can see what's going on. I understand what's going on. Cool. Let's see what happens. So there you go. Any, any questions or thoughts, John? No, I just, uh, check them out. Um, and I'm with you looking at the, uh, the, the, the UI or UX, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, looks to be very, well thought out yes and gives you the same information that other like Eero gives you a lot of that information as well but they don't necessarily lay it out they don't paint um, it for you right <laughs> yeah. right that you can go like Eero you can go to a uh, you can click on one of your Eero's and it'll say oh yeah well there, here's all the things that I'm talking to right right but it doesn't do it graphically and maybe they'll um Maybe they'll add that someday. But, it would be nice. Um, no, it's a useful yeah. feature to understand how you're, because uh, yeah, Aero. I mean, I trust it's doing the right thing, but but it's uh, and and some of the other systems too. It's difficult to to get the big picture, right? Because um, you have to jump all over the place. Whereas these guys are just like, yep, here's 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 the big picture. Yeah, you want to see? That'd be it? fun to go. see. You know, to see it making the decisions and all it's that awesome. And, uh, and it, that's the thing. It makes those decisions so much faster than any other mesh that I've tested. Uh, you know, like watching my devices jump between mesh points with this, it happens almost mm -hmm. in real time as I'm walking around the house. Whereas with others, you know, my devices will hang on for a while until it finally switches. But this is, like I said, this is very actively kind of managing it. And I, I'm, it's possible that active management could cause issues with some devices, which is why I want to test it with all of my stuff and see how that goes. I haven't experienced that yet. And it's been, you know, three days, but that's why I test these things for, for you folks before I, you know, before I now. And, I mean, the revenue model, I think, is interesting. I like so it. So it's both yeah. the hardware and then the membership. Now, how much can't you do if you don't have a member? I, I mean, I think you said you can use the system without a membership. You can. What you don't get is all of the kind of intelligence that the cloud provides down to the mesh. So knowing, okay, the iPhone deals with... Uh, roaming this way, you know, the the Samsung Galaxy, whatever deals with it that way. The MacBook Pro deals with it this way. Right. You don't get any of that. What you also don't get is something I haven't mentioned, but there's a lot of smarts in you get three types of of authentication that you can use. I don't want to say three types of networks because it's all using the same Wi-Fi, but you get normal, uh, you know, full featured Internet. Right. You get a guest network. And then you also have an internet only network. The guest network is kind of cool because you can set what of your local devices guests are allowed to talk with. So if you say wanted to let people, you know, either talk to your Apple TV or talk to your printer or whatever, you can do that while limiting their ability to talk to other computers. And here's where it gets really fun, John. You can do it by password and you can even do that on your main network. So you can have one SSID with multiple different passwords and people have different levels of access depending on which password they use, which is really cool. So if, for example, you wanted to change your Wi-Fi password, like for years, we never ran a guest network or anything here at the house because it just wasn't a thing. And so all of my kids' friends know our Wi-Fi password. I don't want to change everything, but I could add a new Wi-Fi password for my main network to this, slowly change things over to it with both passwords functioning just fine 
and then begin to limit access to the things using the old password and essentially nudge people over to a guest network without ever worrying about it. Or I could have different passwords for my IoT devices and easily turn off all of my IoT devices with one little tap. So it's really cool. Like, and that's the kind of stuff that goes away when you're not using the subscription. So it's pretty cool. I, like I said, I'm, I, you, you can probably hear it in my voice. I'm, I'm cautiously very impressed with this. So we'll go from there. Good. Yeah. Sweet. Sweet. Another uh, cool stuff found that we won't spend nearly as much time on as we did this one is the new Best Tech Wi-Fi smart plug. Uh, the thing that impresses me about this, it, it's totally Wi-Fi capable. So it just like speaking of Internet of Things devices, it just connects to your stuff. But it's 16 bucks and it has two USB ports on it that you can use, too. But it's it's a plug. You can control it with uh, Amazon's A-Lady, Google Assistant and IFT. Right. And uh, I, I've been testing it for a little while and, it you know, it it works. There's no uh, it's a it's a thing. It's, it's a it's a plug, right? But uh, for sixteen bucks, that's that's a pretty aggressive price for a Wi-Fi capable plug, you know. And for your summer travels, if you want to have lights at home that you're turning on and off, or you know, you have a schedule, you can let Ift do that. Um, not a not a bad little thing. You can buy a couple of these and not break the bank. So I've been I've been impressed with it. Good stuff. Yeah. Anything else, Mister Braun? Huh. Smart plug. Yeah. It it's smart. It means it's smart. Yeah. The next thing I really need to check out is smart switches, um, not Ethernet switches, although that's another topic to talk about, but smart, you know, light switch replacements, because that is one easy way to start converting entire rooms to be intelligent. And then you don't have to put a cover over the switch. If you, you know, plug the, the device in, because, uh, you know, if, like a smart plug, the outlet needs to be alive all the time in order for the smart plug to do its thing with its on and off. So, so I want to check those out, too. I haven't I haven't tested it yet, but there you go. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's any other. Uh, oh, you know, in the uh, in the Qi charging world, one of my favorite brands to to play with their stuff and they, they just make quality stuff is Fuse Chicken. And they came out with a really nice, um, they call it their Gravity Touch Premium Wireless Charging Base. It's a Qi charger. Uh, it wouldn't be good next to your bed because there's a blue light on all the time. But uh, you can either get it with leather, a leather surface or a bamboo surface. And it's uh, either 40 bucks or 45 bucks. It's the $5 is the difference between the leather. And, uh, and it, it, you know, it's, a, it's just a nice looking charging base. It's the full size of, of your iPhone. Like my iPhone 10, you know, fits on this base very, very well. So it's not like teetered on one of those charging pucks or anything. It just, you know, it's a nice little thing. You just put it down. And it's like I said, yeah, 45 bucks. So, but I wouldn't put it next to your bed. Nice on the desk. Looks good on the desk. In fact, Andrew has a cool stuff found for us, John, unless you have something else. I do. Let me, um, you want me to do Andrew? Yeah, let, me, and... let me get some more info on it, but it's a, it's also a, a chi thing. Okay, cool. I'll do. I'll, I'll I'll read about Andrew here. So, oh, I need to get back. I've got all over the place with my notes. Andrew says uh, he suggests this app. It's an iOS app called Export Contact from New Marketing Lab Inc. Uh, he says it's an awesome app. Awesome app that lets you export your iPhone contact list into a CSV file. He says it's really hard to do this on a Mac. This app makes it super easy, and then you can save it to Dropbox or really wherever you want. And uh, it's $2.99 US. And so if you want to take your contacts and export them to CSV so that you can import them or just back them up in a you know format that really you could read with anything, that's the way to do it. So thanks for that, Andrew. Good stuff. Ready, John? I'm ready. No, okay. I got this a while ago, and the uh, the price has been uh, floating around here and there, but I don't think I've mentioned it yet. Okay. No, I will, but it's the iAudi Easy One Touch Qi Wireless Fast Charge Car Mount. Huh. 
Okay. And it's a universal mount. will work with, you know, any Qi phone. But uh, once I got the, uh, you know, my uh, iPhone here that would accept that sort of thing, I'm like, well, I better upgrade my... Uh, yeah? Better upgrade my car mount so I can do the wireless charging. So it's really neat that, um, you know, it has little... Uh, you can you can put it in gimme mode, and then there's a little button on it, and when you press your phone against it, the, the little clamps kind of wrap around your phone. Yeah, yeah. And it's adjustable, and it, you know, charges it wirelessly, so there's uh, less of, well, you still have to have a cable running to power in the car. But, um, the cable to the thing. Yeah, that, that, we actually mentioned that in 699. That's exactly the same one I use. Uh, although I connected it to their CD player, um, you know, bracket so that I, I can just put the thing in my CD player and I don't have to put it like, does that, does that one mount to your air vents or is that, uh, like just no, it's suction. suction. It's no. the suction. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I, I like that thing. I will say though, that if you're using your phone for directions, um, it will not in my experience anyway, with my phone, if the screen is on and GPS is in use and all of that, it, the amount of power that the Qi is able to pass to the phone basically leaves the phone even, right? You don't, I don't lose power, but I don't gain power doing this. Have you experienced that too? Uh, no, it, it increases, but no, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, it, but what I find is it's super handy to just have there and, and like I can throw my phone in it. And if I do need to use it for directions for, say, a long drive, like I noticed this when I came down to your house the last time. In fact, it was this mount that I was using. Um, you know, I, I got halfway there and it was like, whoa, like I need I need to charge my phone because we're going to go into Manhattan later and I need to have a full charge when I get to John's house. So I just grabbed my my lightning cable and plugged it into the bottom of the phone, even though it's in the mount. It's fine. As we talked about on the show, the, the phone's smart enough and will charge from lightning and stop charging from Qi when you plug in a lightning cable, even if the Qi coil is right there. So so it you know it doesn't hurt the phone or anything. Yeah, I like that thing, especially like you said, I like the little arms that auto grab the phone when you pop it in the mount. It's pretty good. Yeah. And it's uh, what, 50 bucks at Amazon, I think. Right. Oh no! Well, what did I get it for? So I think it was a thrifter coupon deal. Mm. So the price now is uh, on Amazon that I'm looking here. It's forty nine ninety four. But when I ordered it, I got it for the amazing low price of thirty four ninety seven. <laughs> oh, nice! That's wow! That's a good price. Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. That's great, man. Uh, I want to take a minute and thank all of our premium subscribers that contributed this week, but really I want to thank it. I mean, it's, you know, like I said, it's our 13th anniversary. We, um, we couldn't and, and wouldn't do this without all of you premium subscribers, non-premium subscribers, you know, listeners, contributors, folks that help out in the, the Facebook group. Those of you that will be helping out in the forums, we're looking for moderators, of course. So, you know, as that kind of bubbles to the surface, we would love to engage with you on that kind of stuff. Really, really, um, I mean, it, you know, like we said at the beginning, you know, you helped define the, the mission for this show by simply engaging with us when we started answering your questions, you know, almost 13 years ago. So, uh, so it, it, you know, it, it, it means a lot. And I, I do want to thank everyone. And then also, as we always do, thank those of you that contributed, um, this week, uh, either on manual or new subscriptions or, uh, the auto renew that, uh, that, that so many of you sign up for and really makes a difference for us. So on the biannual plan at $25, uh, per month we had, or sorry, that's not what biannual means, Dave. On the biannual plan at $25 every six months, we have James B., Jeff K., Tony S., Francis F. I got to look here because things change a little bit. Uh, Randall M., Michael M., Larry S., John E., Phil G., Stacy S., and Guy D. Thank you all very much. On also on the biannual plan at $50 every six months, because you can choose your own amount. 
We have Joe M. and Chris B. Thank you very much. And also on the biannual planet, $35 every six months, we have Charles G. and Anders E. So thanks to all of you. On the monthly $10 plan, we have uh, in the last, well, it's really not the last week. It's the last week and a half because we delayed this show to do it on our anniversary. We have Michael L., Chris F., Paul M., Michael C., Mark R., Dave C., Bob L. from the Working Smarter for Mac Users, Dr. Bob, Ryan M., Neil L., Scott F., John G., Frank A., Abdullah B., James C., Barry F., Joe S., Ari L., Michael P., and a different Bob L. So thanks to all of you. And then uh, a one-time contribution of 100 bucks from Steve S. as a happy anniversary gift. Thank you very, very kindly, Steve, and thank you very kindly, everyone. This is, uh, like I said, it's, it's awesome and inspiring. To It drives us to put together the best show we can for you every week. So I got some quick tips on the list here, John. I think we still got some time. You want to, shall we do those? Quick, quick, quick. Okay, cool. Uh, listener David brings us uh, actually a great quick tip. I did not know this. He says, I use command tab all the time to switch between open apps all the time. He says. But as handy as that feature is uh, compared to reaching for the mouse or trackpad, I've been frustrated at times when I have simply too many programs open to quickly switch to the one I want. Uh, He says, and I really hate it when I have that many programs open and I'm hitting the tab key too fast and I race past the one I'm looking for, causing me to have to loop around or to open the wrong thing. He says, then I guess one day I must have been going too fast for my own good and didn't even let go of the mouse while I was command tab switching. And I saw the highlighted app icon go the wrong way altogether. I didn't realize what I'd done until I repeated it by mistake again. But that's my tip. While still holding down command. So you hit command tab to bring up the app switcher. And then while still keeping command held down, float the mouse over any app icon. And as soon as it's highlighted, you don't even need to click. Just let go of command. And whatever you've focused the mouse on or floated the mouse over at that point, that's the app you'll switch to, which is pretty cool. I had no idea about this. Did you know this, John? No. Pretty cool, isn't it? it? I'd never tried it either. Yeah. Yet another one of those, where is this documented kind of things? And maybe it is documented. I just never saw it before. So There's another mini one. So he said sometimes he runs into a situation where he blows past the, yeah, uh, thing it has to loop around again. Yep. Well, here's the other thing you can do. So command tab switches between apps. Command shift tab makes it go in the other direction. That's right. So oh yeah, if you blow past call. one. Hold down shift and go back to uh, rather than looping around. Though you know it's not like you're gonna. It'll let you save a little time. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You got running. Yep. Yep. Cool. All right. And then uh, listener Daniel, where am I here? There we are. Listener Daniel writes in and says, uh, file this one under things to know to avoid getting caught. And he's actually got two tips. We'll start with the first one because that's by definition where you start. Uh, he says on a recent trip, my dad was having trouble connecting to his win- connecting his Windows laptop to his iPhone's personal hotspot. We tried all of the usual troubleshooting, toggling Wi-Fi, checking network settings, even restarting the computer. Nothing was working. We knew something was odd because my iPhone and laptop were working happily just on the other side of the table. I finally remembered way back in my brain about having read that spaces in the SSID or network name would cause a connection failure. Sure enough, the SSID on my hotspot was just Daniel rather than the default Daniel's iPhone. So I directed him to settings general about name on his iPhone to change the SSID device name to something different without a space. And he was off to the races. So the general advice is don't put any special characters, no spaces, no apostrophes, no nothing, even though that's the default, right? Like that is what Apple announces and you should be allowed to have those. But as Daniel Noted here, some machines, in this case, a Windows machine, was not happy connecting. So if you want to simplify, yeah. not a bad idea. Yep. Yep. And he has yeah, a book. I've, I've, Go ahead. I think we've all seen parsing. I'll call that a parsing issue. Mm-hmm. They're like, 
the code just wasn't written to handle something that's not alphanumeric, which to me is just silliness. It's but, um, silly, but it's how, yeah, it's how. It the other thing is that I run into this also, uh, not as of late, but um, yeah, putting spaces in file names sometimes confuses certain apps. Um, so what I would do sometimes to get around that, it was mostly on Windows, I think, back in the day, but um, put like a dash or something instead of a space. Uh, I remember that. I, I I distinctly remember having this problem early on, not so much huh. on the Mac, but on Windows. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and then we have a second tip from Daniel. He says the bonus tip is that if you were to change your iPhone's, uh, you know, uh, hotspot SSID and password to match your home network details, then all the devices you travel with would auto connect to your hotspot without any additional client configuration at all. That's an interesting thing. Now you'd have to be careful uh, and be mindful to turn your hotspot off when you don't want to use it. Otherwise devices at home, like, you know, your Apple TV might start streaming Netflix across your iPhone's hotspot instead of your home Wi-Fi if if both are there and advertising the same network name. But uh, not a bad idea if you want to make life simple. Just be aware that all of your family's devices would connect. Like, you know, I, I don't know if Daniel lives with his father or not, but if they both lived in the same house, then Daniel's father's laptop wouldn't be able to connect to his phone because the network name was wrong. But if Daniel's name was the same as the network they all use at home, then boom. And all your friends, anybody that you've given your Wi-Fi password to would also just auto connect to your iPhone's hotspot. So there's a there's a couple of caveats there, but there there is a simplicity that comes along with it. So I like that. That's good. Interesting. Uh, interesting thought, huh, John? Uh-huh. Uh, one last quick tip that, well, it's interesting and then sort of funny. Uh, listener John said, I discovered this trick when I used to work concessions at a local venue. If I ever found an iPhone that was lost and not mine, he says, I would activate Siri and say, call mom. Nine times out of 10, that call went to the person's mom because, and who could then get a hold of the person somehow and tell him or her that I had their iPhone. He says, I'm assuming it would also work with Android phones, but I never tried that. Thought I'd just pass that along. That's great advice. Because Siri can make those kinds of calls usually uh, to without being unlocked, which is super handy. So uh, that's good tip. Well, hey, there's a yeah. there's a setting for that. Right, that's true. Yeah, I was just digging around. So if you go to um, if you go to settings, Siri and search, there's actually a slider saying allow Siri when locked. And I would assume that the phone is locked if someone has lost it. Right. So I've seen some people who don't lock their phones. Sure. Yeah, just like the old days. Yeah. 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 No, I try, I I wag my finger at some of my family members. You know, like I'll pick up my sister's phone and I'm like, Your phone's not locked. It's like, well, why would I want to do that? I'm yeah, like, why would I want to no. lock it? <laughs> <laughs> there might be a reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I I got some I think we all have some data on our phone that we probably did not want to share yeah. with, uh, with the world. Yeah, well, and it's you know, here's the thing, like not only do you have data about you on your phone that you wouldn't want to share, but in your contacts and maybe your calendar, you've got data about other people that they might not want you to share. And and so there is that whole conversation of, you know, uh, where where does that responsibility end? Like if I've given you my phone number, I mean, I'll give anybody my phone number. I don't care. Right. I publish my phone number online. It's not a big deal. But some people don't feel that way about their phone numbers and they feel like they should be kept private. And so it's not up to me to decide that, uh, you know, I don't want a password on my phone. But that means that anybody that grabs my phone can see your phone number, too. That's not such a good thing. So it, it's an, it, it it's we're still figuring this out, John, this whole the, you know, ethics and and just the way these types of devices integrate into society. So I, I think about it this way, you know, when, when cars were first built, we didn't really have, you know, laws about cars. We didn't have driver's licenses. We didn't have traffic 
uh, protocols. I mean, yes, they're, they're laws, but we also have just simple traffic protocols that everybody follows. Like the, the four-way stop point, right? We all know what to do when we get to a four-way stop. Yeah, some people screw it up no, every now don't. and then. Right, yeah, yeah, I know. But but in general, like they work really well. There, there aren't accidents at four-way stops daily, right? Y- you know, they they generally tend to work really well. But that's a pretty advanced concept, right? And the fact that that, that advanced concept is 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 shared amongst the hive mind is pretty cool. But we aren't at that point yet with smartphones. We have not hit the four-way stop point yet. We're getting there. We're figuring it out. And we're, you know, sorting through these things. We're learning. But, you know, we're not there yet, let alone to the point where we have traffic lights and, you know, other things. Like, we're just not there. And it's okay. I mean, we've had these things for 10 years. I remember a while back when they they added the ability to call someone with the uh, the A-word device yeah i remember i think i had one one person on my list and they're like um so i don't know if i'm too happy about you putting my contact information and sharing it with with uh with those guys and i'm yep. like oh i didn't even really think didn't even about think it. about it exactly yeah or what if you Sorry. What if you sync your you turn on that switch in in iOS which is sort of automatic uh why um you know what happens if you turn on that switch that says sync my contacts with Google right or or iCloud for that matter right now Google has I mean Google's got your phone number John mm. now I mean I I I I, I, I don't know for certain, but I assume that you've probably already done that at some level too. But if you haven't, mm. well, then I screwed you and I'm sorry about that. But you know, that that's uh, like, these are the no, things. I got my contacts in the cloud too, just because it's convenient. Cause but, it's yeah. convenient. That's the thing though. It's like, we don't think about all the implications of, of not locking our phones. So, or not, you know, flip hitting that button. And I'm sure my phone number is shared to Facebook because someone has synced their contacts with Facebook and has my number in there. It's like, yeah, okay. And the thing is, as we've seen, there are people that just don't care to follow protocol. Like right now, I'm getting this one. Totally. I've gotten this one too. But it's a number. It's always from a different area. And it's like, uh, I don't re- I don't recall uh, you know knowing anybody in that area. And it's one of these outfits that are claiming that they'll give me 0%. Uh, they're like, oh, we've been monitoring your credit. And yeah. uh, you know, they even leave a voicemail. And I'm like, uh, no. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, because they leave a generic message. And it's like, um, so which company are you with again? Yeah, they don't know. They're just and trying I think to, they're, they're with, uh, around. Yeah. Well, I think they're with, uh, with scamsters international <laughs> it could be you never know it could be some bank that's no just i know they're aggressive. fishing for yeah no it's not it's not one of my companies because no but i'm saying it could be a different bank that wants your business <laughs> i mean it's possible right you know knowing about it that way i think it's a place that's just fishing for credit card numbers because that know, could they're also giving me be. the promise of getting zero percent interest uh right right for transferring balances or whatever yep Right, yeah, I really it, get plenty of those deals. But anyway, it could, so. right, I was just going to say, it could be one of those legit deals and they know that you throw away all your junk mail, so let me see if I can get you on the phone and, and get you that way. I mean, it, it, could be, it could be a legit business that's just trying different marketing tactics. But It yeah. could be, Dave. Could but be. I'm going to give you another legit thing. Okay. And that's our email address. That's totally legit. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Did you say feedback at MacGeekGab.com? I'm afraid I did. I said feedback at MackieGap.com. I'm not going to spoil the surprise, but I got something last night as a uh, as a as a thank you gift for presenting at our local Mac user group that uh, that I'll actually I'll, I'll tell you about in the next episode because I want to take the right picture of it and I want to use it for album art uh, for the for maybe next week's podcast. So we've added album art, by the way, custom album art to each podcast episode because, you know, like, why not? We should. And so uh, so if you folks have anything, any thoughts about album art, send that in to us. And uh, you can use the email address we just described. You can use premium at MacGeekGab.com if you're one of our premium supporters. Uh, you can tell us about album art you'd like to use, but you can't. I guess you could probably text it to us. 
at 224-888-GEEK. In fact, I'm pretty sure that would work. So that's 224-888-GEEK. You can call or text us there. And John Geek is... Four, three, three, five. That's correct. Uh, and check out our new forums. Please check out our new forums. MacGeekGab.com slash forums. Uh, I saw some Slack messages coming in while we were here. I think some of you had visited the forums already, and there might be a tweak or two that Adam's already taken care of for us. So it's this is why we soft launch, because there's bound to be some things that we didn't test. We didn't come up with in testing, even though we all, a lot of us tested it together. So... Uh, that's what we've got. I want to thank Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth for almost all of our 13 years, but certainly for now. And, uh, and our sponsors, as I mentioned during the show, Setapp at Setapp dot com. We've got Barebones Software at Barebones.com. We've got Crossover at Codeweavers.com slash MGG. Of course, Smile Software, an ongoing uh, sponsor at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Otherworld Computing, an ongoing sponsor, maxsales.com. Ring at ring.com slash MGG. And, uh, you know, since there's so many of you that listen, I figure we should let you have the last word here today. Don't get caught. 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 Don't get caught.